Welcome back to the broadcast. This is Inside Politics. Now, upon taking over the reins in the judiciary, Chief Justice Martha Kome asked the other two arms of government, the executive and the legislature, to respect the decisions of the judiciary. She told the other organs that despite interdependence, they all have their own independence. Towards this end, uh, Kome assured Kenya that she will ensure the powers of the judiciary are not interfered with and that a mantra would be respect for the rule of law. KTN senior political reporter Chris Hairo has details of some of Kome's, part of Kome's agenda. Soon after taking her oath of office as the 15th and the first female Chief Justice, Martha Karambu Kome headed straight to the Supreme Court of Kenya, where her office is located and was received by members of the Judicial Service Commission, whereupon she is judges of the Supreme Court as well as other court staff. Given that she takes over office when the relationship between the judiciary and the executive is frosty, she was quick to remind the other arms of government to each play their role. The executive has a duty to ensure budgetary allocations that support the functions of the judiciary, to ensure that we get the support necessary for the court orders to be obeyed and implemented, that the investigations and prosecution of cases are undertaken efficiently. The registration has the mandate to make law and oversight other branches, including in approved nominations, like they did of mine. Noting that the current regime has been accused of disobeying court orders, the new Chief Justice asked both arms of government to respect court decisions and pursue appeals through the laid down constitutional avenues. To resolve conflict, however, doesn't mean that all parties are satisfied and our constitutional democracy requires that those who are dissatisfied with the legal rulings and judgments pursue the matter through judicial process and legal channels. As we continue to encourage legal dissolution of conflict and enforcement of court orders, we intend to create an enabling environment where everybody is treated with dignity. And therefore, then we will attain sustainable development. With the fate of 40 judges appointed to various courts across the country still in the hands of President Uru Kenyatta, the Chief Justice reminded the executive that the independence of the judiciary must be respected. There are no difficulties to state that the independence of the judiciary in decision making and as stated in the hold that I and my brother have taken today cannot be interfered with. Our decision making in hiring of staff, that independence is protected and ring-fenced in the Constitution, such that any party or authority attempting to direct how the judiciary should decide a matter would be in violation of the Constitution. The executive and parliament have been accused of underfunding the judiciary, hindering them from delivering services to Kenyans. But according to Kome, she's ready to fill in the gaps. As the judiciary, we are accountable for the resources entrusted to us, both human resource. We are accountable for every hour and every day of work as well as other resources entrusted to us. She also vowed to uphold the rule of law and her oath of office. Impartiality, independence, fairness, power to protect the Constitution, to render service and in, with integrity and competency. This oath will constantly remind me that this power is entrusted to us as servants of the people. The new Chief Justice will assume office officially when she will receive the instruments of power from the Deputy Chief Justice Philomena Mwilu, who has been serving as the acting CJ for five months since the retirement of David Kenani Maraga on Monday. And as she takes office as the 15th and the first female Chief Justice in the Republic of Kenya, her entry is already full, but her main promise to Kenyans is to protect the independence of the judiciary. Chris Dairo, KTN News at the Supreme Court of Kenya. Thank you, Chris. Let me begin with you on this, uh, Hesborn. Um, listening to the first uh, a few remarks as official, uh, officially as uh, the Chief Justice, what, 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 do, what do you make of Martha Kome's agenda for, for the judiciary? 
Well, uh, I think listening to her and looking at the process so far and an understanding of, uh, you know, uh, Lady Justice Martha Kohome, I think there's a lot of optimism uh, among Kenyans. And I, I think as a Kenyan, I'm also very optimistic that we are getting into a very interesting, uh, you know, judicial dispensation and, uh, you know, the impact it's going to have on our social, political and economic dispensation for a number of reasons. One, uh, unlike uh, her two predecessors, you know, she's worked both in the civil society and in the judiciary. You know, I mean, an experience as a judge from 2003 to 2011, and then from 2011 to date as a court of appeal judge, basically tells you that she has an understanding of, of, of uh, you know, the judiciary and, and the corridors of justice. Unlike uh, uh, Mara Mutunga, who was purely from, you know, the civil society. And then, of course, unlike Maraga, who did not have any significant experience as an advocate or as, as a fighter in the civil society. And then, of course, you, you look at the way she explains herself and the fact that she's so alive to the corruption that is in the judiciary and, uh, you know, the interest that she's had, this overarching interest of the role of the society in almost everything. And I remember the TSC ruling that she made with other judges and how she was looking at you know pupils and students in high school and, and uh, you know the responsibility of TSC you know uh, which is fairly overarching so this big picture of the society in dispensation of the law I think puts her in a very good position and and you look at that experience is also fairly good and the commitment that she's making but I think she has had a career and she's got that temperament that puts her in a well-posed position. But whether she does well or not, of course, is a function of so many other extraneous factors because she's been part of the judiciary. She understands so much about the judiciary, but now she's going to be the head of the judiciary. And I think that brings in a lot of dynamics and how she's going to handle those dynamics, you know, will say so much about her leadership. But as far as the time, I think time is on our side uh, compared to the other two uh, chief uh, justices that we've had. And there's a lot to expect from her. And we expect that she'll have, uh, you know, the cooperation from the other arms of the government, especially the executive. All right. Dismas, uh, Martha Kome uh, comes in as a, somebody who's, uh, you know, smashing a very important glass ceiling, becoming the first female chief justice. Um, some... Some people have, uh, have been trying to disparage her, uh, given the, this, the, the timing of when she's coming into office with the BBI having been nullified by the High Court and the uh, possibility of it ending up at, at the Supreme Court. But uh, listening to her, she said, uh, you know, the independence of the judiciary cannot be interfered with. She spoke very strongly um, about also the budgetary issues that we've been seeing between the executive and judiciary. What, what, do you, what, do you, what do you see when you listen to her? First of all, let me address the color issues in your question. Now, you recall that uh, the president is supposed to have appointed uh, 40 or 41 judges a long time ago. People have been waiting for days on end. People have been yawning. That has not happened. And the people keep on asking the president, how come you are not appointing these people? Then uh, he gets the name of uh, Justice Ouko, William Ouko, and Justice Martha Kome and that does it in a record speed. The same people have been complaining about the delay in appointments now do a quick U-turn and asking the president, wait a minute, why are you so fast in these appointments? So now you begin to wonder, what kind of people do we have in this uh, civil society who, when the president delays in making the appointments, they go to the top of uh, North Mount Kenya, Mount Kilimanjaro, and make a lot of noise, and when he does it with speed, Again, they are complaining. Then they complain that because of the high speed, there's a very high chance that uh, she's going to be compromised. For me, I think that is the kind of uh, voodoo logic that we need to dwell with. Let the president do as he thinks. If uh, he wants, if you, if you get the name in the morning... you support the fact that he has not appointed the 41 judges of the Court of Appeal? No, no, you, you recall on this show we've uh, requested in terms above number to immediately appoint those judges, and then we get uh, commissions or tribunals you know, appointed to investigate the course. Because it's probably him and his uh, kitchen cabinet who know why he don't have those uh, 40 okay. judges. Okay. But there's a valid expectation that once the Judicial Service Commission has given you the names, 
you make those appointments. So he, needs, he owes us an explanation. All right. But when he acts with speed, you shouldn't blame him. Back to Martha Kome. Yeah, but, but back to Martha Kome, the speech which she gave was uh, fairly stale, and you needed a lot of uh, coffee to stay awake and listen to it. But inherent in the speech, she made three important points. Number one, that uh, the financial independence of judiciary is not going to be negotiable. That uh, the judiciary needs to have its own independent resources. And I'm hoping, because she says that uh, she can make calls, she's going to work very fast and very hard and very smart to ensure that we have the judicial fund functional. So that the amount of money the judiciary gets does not depend on the emotional state of the National Assembly or the executive. Mm -hmm. Because you know, when the judiciary do their work, then uh, the national government or the National Assembly and the Senate decide on how much money to give. The second thing, she must defend the institutional independence of the judiciary so that the entire institution feels very safe. And thirdly, and most important, is the decisional independence of the individual judges. So that when judges are taking their decisions, it's not like in our, in our neighboring countries where a judge takes a decision, it goes to state out, it's reviewed, it comes back, and then uh, it's read. So in my view, those are the three things that uh, she must do. And on the issue of uh, BBI, mm -hmm. I don't know people have been saying that uh, our entry is going to be full, but I'm wondering, is that Chief Justice in Kenya who's been appointed and they go to office and the entry has gone nothing? So I don't know why you keep on repeating about that. But in my view, she must be guided by the Kenyan constitution and Kenyan constitution only. She must not be emotional about this issue. And the fact that the president of the Republic of Kenya comes from Mount Kenya and she comes from Mount Kenya, that kind of thing must not influence uh, our judgment. Because Kenyans have got valid expectation, including Moran, that she's going to be faithful to the constitution that are, or rather the oath that she took for office. And it was a very refreshing that the president decided to throw away his speech and read that oath that they had taken to office and reminded them that they need to be loyal to that oath of office. All right. Uh, Rosalind, what, 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 what is your take on from Martha Kome's maiden speech? Uh, first, Ben, for her to have assumed that uh, third arm of government to head that office is here, historic and being the 15th uh, since the independence of the judiciary. But from where I sit, I think her plate is full, just like we've been talking about it. Uh, because you see, when Maraga was exiting office, there was a severe relationship between not just the executive, but also parliament. Yes. So she's coming in at a time that she needs to uh, reignite the relationship that the judiciary has with parliament. She also needs to do the same with the executive. Now, if you look at the constitution, we talk about they should relate interdependent but remain independent. Now, this thin line is where we always not, we are not very keen to ensure that it is observed. Where when somebody comes into office, the reciting of the oath of office is very um, exciting and you will be carrying the Bible in front of all Kenyans. But after that, there are those dynamics but that play. So when she comes to that office, she's going to face a lot. We have even seen people talking about the BBI bill now, not even going to the Court of Appeal, but going straight to the court, uh, the Supreme Court. Now, these are the things that she need to come out of and, uh, and assure Kenyans that I actually came here and the pledges I met, I, I, uh, I made that I'm going to commit to the independence and the integrity of this institution must be upheld. Now, this must has talked about the issue of uh, judicial funding. It has been an issue, and it remained an issue during Maraga's time. I hope when she comes on board, she's going to ensure this matter is resolved because it also affects uh, the efficiency of the judiciary. If you look currently, uh, judiciary is getting 17 billion allocation. Now, if you look that and look at parliament that has even a smaller number, parliament is getting 39 billion. So again, this one is a toll order on her. How will she navigate this to ensure that the judiciary get more allocation? The other issue of independence is also going to be very paramount for her. Because in terms of independence, that is where it boils down to the issue of 
of honoring court orders. And I think Maraga talked about the issue of court orders, that if you don't honor them, then we are, we are throwing our rule of law to the dogs. And when there is no rule of law, we are, what comes in is anarchy. So for her, these are some of the things that she needs to look at, that if court orders are issued, are they actually acted upon? And if not, what happens? Because what we are seeing currently is that courts are issuing court orders and they look like they're just uh, pieces of paper. You choose when to obey them and when not to obey them. Then the other issue she talks about was the efficiency of the judiciary. We are having conversations upon conversations of the backlog of cases that we are having. You find that somebody has uh, filed a case, but there is another one that comes, and this one is fast track. So how will she sh ensure that when cases are, uh, come to the judiciary, they are decided on merit, right. and not because of whoever has filed them? And then you remember during the time of Mutunga and even the time of Maraga, we were talking about the independence of the judges. That is something that she needs to guard jealously, that judges can actually speak through their judgments, and they are not actually held to account because of what they've done, because we have seen lately the bashing against uh, the judges on right. the ruling of uh, BBI. So for me, these are the things that she really needs to work on and see that she has done a turnaround and restored the confidence that Kenyans have in the judiciary because it's only the remaining line of defense now. Tell me very quickly, uh, Rosie, um, speaking of the independence of the judiciary, uh, what, wh where do you think the relationship is going, judging by what the president said, the state of uh, the president said that... Uh, do justice. If you do justice, we will not have a problem with you. And then a few hours before, we had had some very uh, the remarks that Kenyans have not taken very lightly from the Jubilee Party Secretary General, uh, Rafael Tuju, who, who seemed to, some people have taken it as a veiled threat to, to mm -hmm. some of the, to, to the, to the judges. Uh, where, where do you think that relationship is going? Uh, that's why, Ben, I say that she really needs to have a delicate balance on this because as much as she's supposed to uh, deliver justice, she's coming in at a time the, the apex court has not had a good relationship with the executive. Remember, this is the first time that we saw the Supreme Court nullify the presidential elections in 2017. And we saw the conversations about we will reverse it, we will reverse it. And now she's coming in at a time that her predecessor, that is Maraga, had actually documented some of the issues that they were having with the executive and also uh, uh, parliament. Now when she comes on board and the first conversation that the head of state had was that deliver justice and will not have a problem. Then that is already a line cut. So how will she navigate this line to ensure as much as she delivers justice to Kenyans, she still uh, retains that cordial relationship with the two arms of government. Sure. And also when the question, I mean when the president said deliver justice, that was very disturbing. Because you begin to ask yourself, so who is this who is going to define justice? Is it justice as a state house Nairobi, state house President Kenyatta, state house uh, Tangatanga? Who, who defines justice? That is a critical question. And in my view, she must not be intimidated by anybody. The only thing which she needs to intimidate her is the Kenyan constitution, right. nothing mm. else. <clears throat> Brian, what does, does uh, Martha Kome inspire confidence in you? Yeah, yes, she does. Huh? I think she did fairly well. Uh, in those interviews and uh, the time that she's coming in is a very tricky time for her first of all she'll preside over the next uh, general election number two we've had a very heated debate on BBI culminating to its nullification by the High Court and those proponents of uh, those who think they brought uh, Mother Kome on board they are boasting all over that uh, she'll take charge of uh, BBI now. But uh, ideally speaking, uh, Chief Justice role mainly is uh, administrative. So maybe constituting bench that seems friendly to the executive or uh, changing judges from one division to another. But having security of tenure as the CJ, I think uh, Martha will not want to soil her reputation uh, because uh, of the executive or start his uh, presidency at the Supreme Court as the appendage of the executive, I think she will play fair and uh, 
she will instill confidence uh, in the judiciary. I don't think right. we will have a problem with. All right. Hesbon, very quickly, one minute only. Tell me um, what you think the impacts of Martha Kome's leadership at the apex of the uh, Kenyan judiciary will be on the BBI process. Ben, I've lost you. What do you think uh, Martha Kome's leadership of the judiciary, uh, what, what kind of impact do you think that is likely to have on the BBI process? Well, I think uh, looking at the track record, uh, what, what Martha Kome has demonstrated in his judgment, uh, whether her ruling is going to be uh, you know, favoring the pro-BBI team or the anti-BBI team, I think her overarching view of the law serving the interest of the society puts her in a very strong position to deliver what many Kenyans would, would, would actually judge as a fair dispensation of justice. And of course, what this matter has said is very critical about the president pronouncing himself that, uh, you know, she has to preside on a judiciary that, that dispenses justice and who defines what that justice is. I think the public perception is very critical that when any judgment touches on the interest of the public positively, no one would have a problem with that. And I think in as much as you're saying that her entry is very, you know, loaded, I think we expect a lot that serves the interest of the public and no one would have a problem with that. And that is what I see she's going to do as far as the BBI, uh, you know, appeal and the petitions are concerned. All right. Uh, this month, BBI process moving forward with a new CJ in place. What's your prediction? Well, you know, when you, when you review that ruling of uh, those uh, five judges, and even if you have not studied uh, law, you are not a lawyer nor an advocate of the high courts, mm -hmm. but with basic comprehension of the English language, mm -hmm. you see many loopholes. Like, for instance, on the IBC issue, there were there are now three conflicting rulings by three different judges. And then also on the issue that the president cannot initiate a popular initiative. And you know those articles are very clear, 255, 256, 56, 57, but more important, mm -hmm. the first uh, article in our constitution. Now, let's look at a few scenarios. If you've got a president who's uh, been elected in an election which is uh, free, fair, and credible, and the Supreme Court has affirmed as much. And the president wants to change the constitution, but uh, he's got a rogue National Assembly and, uh, na and uh, Senate, yet he's got overwhelming, overwhelming public support. Does it mean that he cannot go do that? What if you've got a member of the National Assembly with very good ideas, but is unable to convince members of the National Assembly or Senate? Does it mean that in that capacity you cannot initiate a um, a popular initiative. So in my view, there are very many things. And uh, what Justice Kome is going to do is to bring in uh, sanity so that the issues are judged on their own merits. A plain reading reads that uh, these uh, judges, it seems that they had issues with the president. And you discard it here. Because, you know, how do you refer to the head of state as uh, Mr. Dismas Mokua, as if the president is a common manner in the village, is the president of the Republic of Kenya. So even if you've got contempt for him, even if he's supposed to have appointed you to bigger office and for some reason he's not, you have to respect the office of the president or you respect the presidency. Not because of the individual, but because of the institution. You also recall some time ago when uh, the state was mistreating Deputy President William Samuel Ruto. We pointed as much that you may not like the Deputy President, but I respect his office. So those are some of the issues, and we've had the chance of speaking to senior counsel in but Kenya. But there's context, this must. Yeah. The, the judges are making a ruling on, yeah. uh, so, on, on whether the Uhuru Kenyatta can be sued. As, on, as, as an individual. As an individual. So there's context to that. But, uh, and you know, obviously, there's context, but uh, two wrongs do not uh, make it a right. Because in, in my view, what you must do is then to start cannot, respecting it, institutions. You see, this, this must, you started, no, 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 just a minute, wait, you started minute. by saying who can, uh, the president can start a popular initiative as an individual. Yes. So why can't the uh, judges address him as an individual also? I think, I think you, can ben, address what, him, what we you can address him without uh, demeaning his office. For me, what I'm talking about is not okay. uh, Uru Mwegai Kenyatta, Mamangina San. I'm talking about the president of the Republic of Kenya. And we should respect people. The same way we should respect the judges. And instead of uh, 
attacking their personalities. Because again, right. I've seen a number of social media people coming with various allegations. Disparage them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Rosalind, Rosalind, very quickly, I, have I, the final I, say I, on this. I, I think what this must should say is that judges speak through their judgments. And if you look at this, uh, the, uh, the ruling on BBI, it was consolidated ruling of various petitions that have come to, uh, to, to court. One of the issues was, can you sue the president in his capacity as an individual? Now, when you address this matter, you don't address the office, but you address the individual. That's why the judges say he cannot be, uh, he cannot be uh, uh, sued as a case, a criminal case, but you can institute a civil case against the person of the presidency, the president. Now, when you're talking about the issue of the, you've said that uh, the ruling has so many loopholes. And I think we owe it to Kenyans to look at it in terms of the, the, the petitions that came to, to the courts and how each was addressed. When it comes to the issue of IBC, there are two issues here. There is a ruling that had been delivered early on the quorum of commissioners who can actually make decisions at IBC. And that did not touch on the constitutionality of the constitution. Now, when it comes to the review of a constitution, the commission cannot sit three commissioners. They have to sit five commissioners. And I think that is what now, the Is that judges, the constitution or an act? That is what the judges were, were discussing, that the number, these people are supposed to be seven. The quorum that makes that decision is supposed to be five and not three. But for the issues of by-elections and the others, they can continue doing what they are doing. So I think we owe it also to tell Kenyans that as much as this was the ruling, which were some of the prayers that had been sought. Now, when you talk about the president, that he can initiate a, a constitutional review in his capacity as a head of state. Look at Article 2, 260. Who are state officers? They are very much defined. The president, the deputy president, right. the MPs, the governors, these are All state right. officers. We're there is no Kenyan in this. Uh, there you, you cannot peg Wanjiku on this category of state officers. True. Yeah. All right. We have, we'll, we'll come back for the final thoughts on that. Uh, we really have to uh, take a quick commercial break. Uh, when we come back, uh, we shall be, as much as we will conclude on this, we shall also be expecting to hear from you. Give us a call. Our studio lines um, will be scrolling at the bottom end of your screen. Have the final say uh, here on Inside Politics.